All right, guys, uh, I've got something really special for you today. So uh, buckle up, because I put a lot of work into fitting the most important things I know into a single analogy. <laughs> so first of all, conflicts of interest, none. But I'll tell you about a bunch of great individuals at the end of the talk. My bio, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on. I'm a software engineer. I'm obsessed with lipids, conducting crazy end of one experiments. You could just Google Dave Feldman and cholesterol. You'll, you'll find plenty on me. I like to call myself a cholesterol traveler now because I moved lipid numbers up and down several times through a series of experiments, and I brought my LDL as high as 368 down to 98, all since the last time I was here. <laughs> but how am I doing this, right? Well, I like to say I'm working from a theory that seems to continue to keep on working. And what I'm happy about is I managed to solve the two biggest problems. The two biggest problems are I'm talking to two audiences all the time. And unfortunately for the experts, they prefer I don't simplify the language. And to be fair, they've got a good point. But I also can't tell an entire audience of lay people all about lipidology very easily. I'm still kind of learning a lot about it myself. So I'm excited because this analogy will be a way for me to get you the abstraction that I see the way that I see it. Because the most important message is the one that I want to get across to you as to what cholesterol is a passenger in. So without further ado, I bring you a wonderful story, a tale of five problems. So in a dystopian future, our country is hit with a massive flood. And the president turns to the secretary of engineering that's a future cabinet position, by the way. <laughs> and he says, OK, well, the houses are fine because it's the future and everyone can work from their home. It's all right, but we still need to be able to get food to them. How are we going to do that? And the engineer says, actually, it's fine. We've got a really large company on the shoreline that can get the food from outside the country and ship it inside. And that's the intestine delivery company. And it has exclusive rights to get all of the food that's gathered from the outside. And it has special ships, these brown ships. And I'm keeping it color coded, so remember brown. To deliver that food around to all of these different houses. Fantastic, fantastic. But after a little while, they realize that it's still kind of uneven. Some of the houses are getting it sooner than others. And unfortunately, some of the houses aren't ready to use the food at the time that they need it. So that brought us to the second problem, a lack of local storage. Engineer says, no problem, no problem. We're going to have these food banks that we have all around these different neighborhoods. And then that way, as the ships come around, sure, they'll feed food to the houses. But on top of that, they'll re-up the adipose food banks. Fantastic. But now we come to the third and most serious problem. And that's that we still have misdistribution. These neighborhoods aren't able to talk to each other. The adipose food bank. Uh, can sometimes have enough, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes the ships have enough to carry, sometimes they don't. And so we now got to deal with the hardest problem of all, balanced distribution. For this, the Secretary of Engineering worked with his whole team and he got a lot of work done. He says, we just need one central player. I give you the liver delivery company. And this one's great because guess what? Not only will all of the brown ships eventually make their way there, but also all of the food that got lost and spilled out into the water and no one can capture, That'll all eventually make its way back here as well. And they have their own special purple boat. And that, too, can deliver this food all around to the different neighborhoods. The president's like, this is fantastic. So let me see if I got this straight. Food that's coming from outside the country, potty, that's coming into the intestine, well, then that actually is going to be loaded onto these brown chips that's going to be distributed. And then all of the stuff that's in the food banks that spills off or spills off from trying to deliver it to the uh, different houses, that's actually also going to make its way to the liver. And that deliver, those purple boats are then gonna, going to counterbalance the amount that's coming from the brown boats. And yes, the engineer says that's exactly right. In fact, when there's more that's coming in from the outside, then that actually means that there'll be less that needs to get pulled from the food banks and ultimately delivered via the liver, right? Likewise, it counterbalances in the other direction. If we have a shortage of food that's coming from the outside, we can counterbalance that with the purple boats. And surprise, I've been talking about lipids this whole time. <laughs> this is why I don't have a shining future as a magician. <laughs> yes, the houses were cells, the fatty acids were the boxes, and of course, if you've got three of those boxes, you've got triglycerides. 
That, of course, was energy being distributed everywhere. But the main thing I wanted you to focus on, the reason I really wanted to drive this home, is all the way up to this point, my story has been about only one thing, distributing food, which was actually just fat-based energy. So what were the means of delivering the food? Well, on the brown line, we've got chylomicrons. Chylomicrons start with a whole bunch of fat-based energy. And they eventually become chylomicron remnants. And where do they end up? They end up back at the liver. The liver has its own line, which has VLDLs and IDLs, right? And if once they're emptied of all of their energy, they return back. But there is something missing from this schematic, of course. But remember, this is the energy, energy delivery portion. If you're watching this on a video, I would be fine if you paused it right now, pondered that for a day, and then come back to this next part. Because the moment I bring up the C word, everything's going to fall apart because it has too much of attention <laughs> associated with it. So now let's get to the fourth problem, support. So the president turns back to the Secretary of Engineering. He says, you've been doing such a great job. But unfortunately, the flood wiped out all of our emergency services. Do you think there's any way you with your smarts could figure out a way that we can still get that support around to the houses? I said, yeah, you know what we'll do? Since these, blue, these purple boats are the most present of all of the boats that are sitting around in our country, we're going to go ahead and outfit them with this special care package. Now, granted, their first job will still be delivery. First job is still delivery. The second job is support. And naturally, what I'm talking about here is cholesterol. So I want to reemphasize this again, because this may be the most important slide, and you might not realize it. First job is delivery. It doesn't both deliver and support. It first delivers, then it supports. And that's extremely relevant to the rest of this analogy. So. Without question, as we're watching in the first job, we're seeing this counterbalance between chylomicrons and VLDLs in delivering fat-based energy. And then after the chylomicrons deliver their energy, they clock out. They're done. The VLDLs take about as much time to deliver the energy, and they then have a second job. They hang out in the neighborhood. They chase off pathogens. They get endocytosed into the cells for additional repair, right? They've got a second gig, and they take that second gig pretty seriously. So now we can add the LDL to our schematic and the HDL to our schematic. Even though I haven't talked about it yet, you just need to know this. With this little dotted line, I'm talking about two different sides, energy delivery on one side, support on the other side. Very relevant when you're looking at these cool graphs I get to make that you'll see in other videos. <laughs> and this one, of course, I showed at the last Breckenridge talk where I was uh, pointing out that I was able to have dietary fat on a three-day average and isolate it about right when I need to do it in order to get resulting LDLP, LDLP, the support boat, right? Why was I able to do that? Do I theorize? Well, now you're starting to get it. You're starting to get the abstraction. I had less dietary fat coming in from the intestine delivery company, which resulted in my body needing to upregulate VLDLs. And what do VLDLs eventually clock out and become? LDLP, that's right. Likewise, when my dietary fat was high, sure enough, my LDLP was low. So don't take my data for it. Let's talk about the emerging data in the low carb, high fat community. Now, I used to lament that doctors I was meeting early on, low carb doctors, they had this great wealth of data from their own patients on cholesterol numbers. And in the spirit of being careful what you wish for, uh, I started this website. <laughs> and now I see like a dozen or more lipid profiles almost every single day. Like it's really ramped up to get to ridiculous levels. But the neat thing is, is we now can actually see the patterns that I was looking for in the first place. And you might be surprised to find this out. But metabolically healthy, low carbers, the key is that they're metabolically healthy. You would think, as I certainly did, that as you go from overweight to lean, what would happen to their cholesterol? Go down, right? Go down. It doesn't. It actually goes up. But what about if you go from sedentary to high energy, high energy demands? Anyone? Goes up. Goes up. Now, I keep looking at this from the abstraction I've just showed you, and I keep thinking, well, wait a sec. If the triglycerides are still staying low, but I'm seeing more of the purple boats, should I be concerned? 
I don't know that I should. So this was where the hypothesis was born, and it's the one I've been working on for quite a long time now. And this is an overly brief version, but basically, high LDL cholesterol and particle count on a low-carb, high-fat diet can be a reflection of higher VLDL secretion and use. The key is and use. These guys are actually needing to drop off these triglycerides at a higher rate and therefore becoming low-density lipoproteins, right? Wouldn't it be great if we had a profile that showcased this perfectly? Some of you already know where I'm about to go. We now have what we call the lean mass hyperresponder. So hyperresponder is somebody who goes on a low-carb, high-fat diet. They see their cholesterol go up substantially. Lean mass hyperresponder was something I identified back in July. I wrote an article about it, and honestly, it was kind of a testing the waters thing. I wanted to write this article, and I wanted to see what the response was, because I half expected a lot of people to write in and say, no, no, no. Actually, I have an LDL above 200. I have uh, triglycerides below 70, and I'm actually very sedentary, and I have all these other issues, et cetera. No, on the contrary, I got inundated. This is the most commented on post of any of that I've had on the blog thus far. And there's people all around the world, and many of you medical professionals in low carb probably know a few, that are lean mass hyperresponders. They tend to be very lean. They tend to be very athletic. Now, this all sounds great. Well, what's the first thing you want to do? This is why I'm so glad Ivor took place before me. We're all about the root cause. It, you want to know how you know an engineer? They're their own worst critic. They have to be because their fellow engineering friends are constantly challenging them. So they need to challenge themselves first. I just have to fit that in. So what I, I love this quote. A great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> I say bring on the ugly facts. So one of the advantages I've been able to have with a little bit of my name equity moving up is I'm actually nearing about 10,000 followers on Twitter. I get to actually get responses from a lot of the people that follow me, and they're not all fans of low carb, high fat. Let me tell you. So I put this out. Question for those in the know, are there any studies that show high LDL with high cardiovascular disease in spite of having low triglycerides? And in doing so, I managed to get one response from Dr. T, hats off to Dr. T for this one, from our friends at Framingham. And actually, I really liked the sample size because it was people who didn't already have uh, cardiovascular disease and after excluding users for lipid-lowering therapy, that's a big deal to me. I don't like gene or drug studies. That's a, that's a talk I could do all by itself. Well, sure enough, I get into the chart, and I'm like, OK. So their baseline here, they have it at uh, an odds ratio is zeroed out at triglycerides below 100, LDL below 100, low HDL, which, by the way, was uh, below 40 for men, uh, below 50 for women, right? And naturally, as we would expect, if you have a high HDLC, odds ratio being lower is better. You have the best version if your triglycerides are below 100 and your LDL is below 100 and you have high HDL. That's like the ideal profile, right? So we would expect if LDL got flipped and we started looking at 100 and above, the odds ratio would probably also flip, right? Go to like 1.3 and 1.4. Uh, no. Actually, it's, next to the, it's the next best risk marker and it's right next to it at 0.7. Well, OK, maybe this was including a lot of people that had an LDL of like 105 and 110. Fortunately, though, they also had a category for people who had an LDL of 130 and above. How many people get prescribed statins for 130 and above? That's the high-risk category, right? Actually, it's identical to 0.7. Now, as you can see on the confidence interval on the right side, this isn't a fantastically large study, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to find any fantastically large studies. So I got really ornery, and I built this graphic and I pushed it around on social media, and I, I really genuinely, and not in a trolley way, truly, trying to ping all of the biggest pro LDL lowering experts that I know. And you can, if you, if you ever get bored, look through my Twitter feed, you can see me doing this. I said, look, 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 you guys are saying we shouldn't take comfort in having low triglycerides and high HDL cholesterol when our LDL cholesterol is high. So can you just bring me one study, just one study, the best study that you can, so long as it's not a drug or a gene study <laughs> that shows that we have higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Anyone want to guess how many studies I got? Zero. Zero. I'm actually hoping, I'm genuinely hoping that this feed and this video will help inspire some people to bring more into comments. I'm sure there's a chance there's some out there, but I still haven't seen it yet. 
And what I am thankful for is it brought me around to something most people don't know about, even in the low-carb community. It's called remnant cholesterol. And I think, when, I think Wikipedia actually summarizes this really well. They say, look, remnant cholesterol, also known as remnant lipoprotein, is a very atherogenic lipoprotein composed primarily of very low-density lipoproteins. That's these guys. And intermediate-density lipoproteins, that's these guys. Stated another way, remnant cholesterol is all plasma cholesterol that is not LDL cholesterol or HDL cholesterol. And this was a big moment for me because before I read any further studies, I said this is actually a perfect match for what it is that I believe is ultimately the root cause of the disease. So let's go back to our analogy again, right? I'm not worried about this. What am I worried about? I'm worried about this. There's no good engineering reason, and I state this all the time, for a lot of energy to be parked in the blood. I cannot think of one, and I've not had anybody present it to me yet. So I have to emphasize, once again, when you think of things from a first job, second job, is it really that high levels of triglycerides are atherogenic? Or even as the remnant cholesterol people are saying, that it's a more atherogenic particle? I don't think so. I think it's a failure of the VLDLs from being able to drop off energy, fat-based energy version of triglycerides. So what do you suppose remnant cholesterol is highly correlated with? Well, I'll actually, yes, I'll actually drive that home. I forgot that I had this slide in here too, so I'll have to fit this one in to really drive this point home. VLDL to LDL life cycle, right? How long do you think VLDLs last in the blood in a normal lipidemic person? Any guesses? An hour, yes, 30, 30 to 60 minutes. How long for IDL? Less than 30 minutes. Now, if it doesn't get absorbed by the liver, how long do they stay in that support role as a low-density lipoprotein? Two to four days. In other words, 99 to 98% of the rest of their life spot is for that long. So yes, where I was going was, here were the studies. Sure enough, it correlates closely to insulin resistance. In fact, Remnant cholesterol correlates much closer to insulin resistance than what I've seen with LDL, as Ivor brought up. Same thing with ischemic heart disease. Notice, by the way, as HDL is going down, remnant cholesterol is going up, even with LDL hardly moving at all. Myocardial infarction. Remnant cholesterol was the lipid fraction most associated with premature myocard myocardial infarction. And my favorite of all, all-cause mortality. Now, which graph do you think you'd want to be in, on the LDL moving up or on the remnant cholesterol moving up? So here's a simple comparison. Somebody I've worked with a lot throughout this whole period. I had, uh, they, had about a one, they had about 177 total cholesterol and an LDL-C of 121, HDL-40. HDL is a little bit low, but triglycerides are 80. That looks pretty good, right? And now on low-carb, high-fat, two and a half years later, they have a total cholesterol of 284, LDLC of 201, HDLC of 71, and triglycerides of 58. This is actually right at the cut points of a lean mass hyperresponder. Yet, on the left side, they have a remnant cholesterol of 16 milligrams per deciliter. They actually have a lower remnant cholesterol on the right side, even for as high as their cholesterol numbers are. Well, let me give you a little bit more of a challenge after I reveal who this person is. <laughs> I want to talk about Craig Moffitt, who, by the way, contributes a lot to our website. Thank you, Craig. And he also will have some data that I'll show you in a second. But would you guess that he's a lean mass hyperresponder? Yeah. He's actually very thin, and he's very athletic. His total cholesterol is 457 milligrams per deciliter. And I hope you've had your beta blocker. His LDLC is 335. His HDLC is 109 and his triglycerides are 67. He is the picture of a far-end lean mass hyperresponder. So you would at least expect remnant cholesterol to probably go with scale, right? Like probably it's just a bit higher anyway. Well, you could probably do the math right now. Actually, it's 13 milligrams per deciliter. It's, it's actually just one pip higher than mine <laughs> on my last test. So how do you calculate remnant cholesterol? Well. There is a caveat to that, which I'll say in a second. But yes, you just take your total cholesterol, you subtract your LDL, you subtract your HDL. You can be forgiven if you thought that actually this whole time total cholesterol was those two added together. No. That remainder is those VLDL boats 
those IDL boats, and specifically the cargo of cholesterol that's on, inside them. Now, the caveat I want to fit in, a lot of you already know this, LDL is typically a, cal a calculated number from the Friedwald equation. So that is a little bit of a confounder, but a lot of the studies are built on the Friedwald equation anyway. So in that sense, there's a little bit of fuzziness. But generally speaking, I tend to find this looks pretty good. And this is what's neat. I literally calculated this just this morning. Cholesterol code data from our site for remnant cholesterol, we have a whole bunch of submitted labs that people have. And I created the criteria of an LDL cholesterol of 200 milligrams a deciliter or above, right? That, by the way, is well into range of hypercholesterol, sorry, familial hypercholesterolemia, which means your doctor will almost certainly give you two medications before you can leave the office, <laughs> right? There's probably statin police around the corner and he just calls them in or something. But with triglycerides of at least 100 milligrams per deciliter or lower. And what's neat is we now have a lot of entries just on the site of 456 total. Of that, I found 138 that met this criteria. How many of those hyper responders who are typically on a low carb, high fat diet for the highest, medium, highest and medium risk categories combined, we ended up with a total of nine out of the 138. For the medium lowest quintile, 44. For the lowest quintile of remnant cholesterol, 84. So over 90% of those that have submitted in concern to our site about their high levels of LDL cholesterol, and in particular, I'm picking them out for those who have 200 and above, over 90% of them have very low remnant cholesterol. Now, do I, have some, I do have some caveats. This presentation doesn't discuss the influence of glucose and glycogen and so forth. And if you follow my work, you know that I, my whole phase two is based on being able to manipulate that as well. Also, I do believe there are bad reasons for higher LDL cholesterol. However, they are typically related to still having higher triglycerides. And for that matter, also with HDL. You do want to keep an eye on HDL and at least determine that if you have low HDL, that's actually genetically influenced. So how am I doing on time? Ten minutes. Yes. Okay. I'm excited about that. that. That analogy I worked on for a long time. So this is great. We can actually look back at the inversion pattern that I had had from the prior talk. And you guys probably remember this for those who've already seen it. For those who haven't, real quick, the inversion pattern as I found in my data, and I've shown this over and over again with, uh, with a large number. I've had a total of 88 blood draws at this point. Insane engineer. Uh, as it turns out, if I were to take my cholesterol this morning, then I would look back to the three days of dietary fat and I would find they had the greatest influence on what my LDLC would be. And likewise, it's also a three day window for LDLP, but there's a two day gap. And uh, Craig Moffat, I uh, didn't get a chance to include it. He actually replicated this experiment entirely uh, with four different data points. And you can look it up on the cholesterolcode.com site where he also talks through, and I don't have the slides for it, but he basically did exactly the same thing and proved the same inversion pattern for both LDLC and LDLP. Now, what's neat is in, in the summer of last year, we actually got a bunch of people together for the KetoFest cholesterol experiment, which by the way, just opened its Kickstarter, small plug. Uh, <laughs> July, July uh, 11th through 17th, we managed to get a bunch of people to eat very low low calorie but still ketogenic for three days and everybody did a water fast and then we all took a blood test one blood test then gorged out on fat for three days and then took a second blood test and what do you suppose happened well first i posted the hypothesis before the experiment began and i said i suspect it'll get much lower well i'm thankful for pts diagnostics who helped pay for all the blood work and we actually got people like this guy who actually helped to contribute it and people like these people to help eat a bunch of the fat they were all a part of it, and voila, we ended up with what I like to call the broken ladder. So you see on the left side, the Friday, of all of the tests that were drawn, and you see on the right side, the Monday, of the second of all of the tests that were drawn, and all that fat was eaten in between. So what do you see most of those lines doing? Going up, down, sideways, yeah. Actually, about 19 had a decrease of between 5 to 38% of their LDL cholesterol. Only three had an increase, and it was only one or two percent. Now, if you look across the board, if you take them all across the board, it is a drop of 16% of their LDLC in three days 
for a total of uh, 25.7 drops in milligrams per deciliter. So let's look at that protocol for the last time I'd done, I'd done this at uh, Breckenridge. That part on the left is actually what I'd shown from before. And we had 100% success rate so far, and that was when we had a lot less people. Now it's approximately 85% of a success rate. And there actually is some caveats that we found that uh, I think I also have a slide in here for. But at that time, nine had tried out a Curiosity, 10 had used it to get their doctor off their back. <laughs> well, between comments on Twitter, Facebook, cholesterol code, Reddit, <laughs> blogs, we have somewhere over 100 people that have tried it by this point. We've lost count. Uh, but it's absolutely amazing that it's still holding to about that 85% success rate given how many people have done this. And last time, at least four people had used this to improve their life insurance rate. At my last count, I found 13, all low carbers. Again, I kind of blame Jeffrey Gerber. He was the first to tweet out about that. <laughs> so look, here's, some, here's the possible protocol pitfalls if you're considering doing the Feldman protocol. And anecdotally, these elements have been the most common. Use of MCT or coconut oil, we kind of discourage because that seems to be a confounder. This is also a new one, use of coffee. Sorry, it seems like coffee does in fact have some different effects on the lipids and has had impacts for our protocol results. And also, some with hyper, hypothyroidism appear to have some unexpected results, and that's also worth pointing out. So in summary, more VLDLs may be trafficked on a low-carb, high-fat diet for fuel. I know I haven't talked about ketones, I know I haven't talked about glucose, but I'm telling you, it's a big elephant in the room that nobody talks about. You get a lot of direct delivery of fatty acids via VLDLs. And this may result in a higher presence of its later stage as an LDL particle, resulting, of course, in what it carries, the passenger LDL cholesterol, right? This may not only be appropriate, but may be mechanistically necessary. And this all relates back to why there's so much overlap with remnant cholesterol, even though they're coming to very different conclusions than I am. I don't believe VLDL and IDL let me just put it this way. I don't believe any lipoprotein is atherogenic. I believe broken systems are atherogenic. So remnant cholesterol is a far stronger indicator of risk of both heart disease and all-cause mortality than LDLC. And finally, remnant cholesterol typically drops on a low-carb diet. I think the reason there hasn't been a lot of attention to remnant cholesterol is because there's not a drug for it yet. <laughs> it's just my opinion. I wanted to thank my patrons because I don't accept any money from any business entity. I've made that a rule up front because I didn't want to, I didn't want to compromise the integrity of the data. I am honored to have 109 people who directly pull money out of their pockets, small amounts, that actually allow for this research to happen. So please, if you could thank them for me. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this.